So thank you very much. Um, I'm delighted to be back here in New Zealand. I was first in New Zealand in 2014 when I was a, a Canterbury um, fellow down at the University of Canterbury in Christchurch for about two months. And I suspect my getting to know um, uh, James Smithies down there was part of the reason I've been invited here today because I understand that he's been part of this community for quite a long time. So uh, a little bit about what I'll be talking about today. I've got about an hour of your time. And I want to talk about this idea of knowledge machines. And hopefully, it will all become a little clearer as I go along what that means, since it's a bit of an opaque term, possibly. Before I really get started, let me give a bit of background of myself and establish my street cred for being at an organization like this. Um, as Andy pointed out, the Oxford Internet Institute, it's a <clears throat> interesting multidisciplinary place. Let me get my glass of water. I am definitely a little bit um, dried out and jet lagged from traveling so far. We're a multidisciplinary department. Don't let the name inst Institute throw you. We're actually a department in the Social Sciences Division at the University of Oxford. We've got about, um, every time our director says how many faculty we have, the number seems to grow. And so I don't know what the actual number is. It's somewhere between 45 and 50 these days um, at various stages of their career. We've also got about 50 master's students and about 25 doctoral students at any given time trying to do this interesting thing of understanding life online. And if you know Oxford at all, Oxford's a very slow-moving beast of an institution in some ways. It's been around for over 800 years. It doesn't make rash decisions. And so the fact that we've got an internet institute at the University of Oxford is, is quite a forward-thinking thing in some ways. We've actually been there for 15 years now. We were established in 2001, and I've been there for 10 of those years. Um, as you can see, I'm a professor of social informatics, and if you, you will be forgiven for not knowing what social informatics is, on my next slide I will explain it to you, um, hopefully in a way that you'll remember, and also director of graduate studies there at the OII. I'm also a faculty fellow at the Alan Turing Institute, and I won't have much time to talk about the Alan Turing Institute today, but if, if you want to catch me in one of the breaks or something, I can talk about what's going on with data science in the UK, because that's what the Alan Turing Institute is all about. It's about advancing data science, not only in the UK, but around the world. So, social informatics, what is this? Uh, you will be forgiven if you haven't run across this term that much before. There's not that many of us in the world. My own degree is in social informatics and information science. I, I got my PhD at the School of Library and Information Science at Indiana in Bloomington and studied with the person who was considered the father of social informatics, Rob Kling. He unfortunately died a number of years ago. But he really influenced the way I think about the world. And this word is how I use to explain people in a very simple way what social informatics means. Do I have a pointer on here? Uh, there. So socio-technical, and I, and I spell it with a hyphen. This actually caused quite a bit of fights with my editor for the book that was just mentioned, because they didn't like spelling it with a hyphen, and they kept trying to take it out. They said, no, it's important. It matters, and you'll see why. Um, when you think, think of the word socio-technical, the left side is obviously socio, social people, things that are, are in the world around us and technical, the kinds of objects and, and machines and data and computers that we think about. And I have argued in this article, if you'd like to look it up, that what social informatics does is examine the hyphen in socio-technical, so how the people are connected to the technology. I'm really interested in that connection between the two. And this differs from some other areas that try to understand socio-technical systems or, or, or the relationships between people and technology. Um, any of you who um, have an academic background in this area called science and technology studies, they tend to focus very heavy on the socio and then bring in the technical later. Some of you who might be from computer science backgrounds tend to start with the technical and then bring in people at the end to make sure that things work and do user interface design. But when I go into a new project, I try and understand it from not predetermining whether the social or the technical is more important in any given situation. So I look at that hyphen. Now, one way to think about how one looks at this hyphen and to think about the, com the complications of putting people and technologies together is I like thinking about a picture like this. So this is Los Angeles, a picture borrowed from Flickr, um, Creative Commons, so it's legal to put it up here. Uh, if you think about the affordances, affordances is an idea of the, the kinds of things that technology lets you do. What are the affordances of cars and roads? Well, they let you do certain kinds of things and build certain kinds of configurations. In the case of Los Angeles, for any of you who've been there, um, they've got giant freeways with lots of cars rushing around all the time, and people drive every place. I used to live in California. You drive absolutely everywhere. There's a 
uh, a movie from many, many years ago called L.A. Story that one of the things that made me laugh when I saw it, it was back in the 80s, um, uh, Steve Martin's in it and he walks out of his house and he gets in his car and he drives about 20 feet forward and gets out of the car and walks down to his neighbor's house because in Los Angeles you drive absolutely everywhere even if it's walking over to the neighbors. So this set of socio-technical choices that is set up in Los Angeles builds this big massive ecosystem of Los Angelinos getting around. This is a picture right outside my office in Oxford. Uh, for those of you who are library aficionados, um, the Bodleian libraries are right down here. Uh, this, my office is just, just over there, to the left of this. This is Balliol College. Now this is all the same technical stuff, right? You've got a road, you've got some cars, you've got people trying to get places. But the socio-technical configuration is actually different in a place like Oxford. This college has been here for over 800 years. The University of Oxford has been here for over 800 years. And we have made a different set of choices on how we get people from place to place, and that results in a different socio-technical configuration, even though the technology is essentially identical. We don't have the same way of going about things in a place like Oxford. So when you look at technical systems, you need to think about the kinds of choices people are making. Now, one of the things I'm always encouraging people not to do is engage in this sort of naive technological determinism that if you read Wired magazine, they're really good at being technological determinists in a naive way, right? Technology X causes Y. You know, the internet makes people stupid or the internet makes people connect to each other. Whatever you want to say, that technology causes X. And instead, you need to think of it in a more nuanced way is that technology allows people to make certain choices and that we need to understand those choices. And they're not unlimited choices. The technology has certain limits of what it's able to do, but also you can ask new things of that technology. And what I've been trying to do over the last decade, 15 years or longer, is to try and understand how, as my book that I'll be talking about quite a lot today, Knowledge Machines, how the choices that researchers have been making about using technologies is influencing the kinds of research that gets done, the kinds of questions that can be asked, and the kinds of things we can know about the world. So this is a picture from one of my articles from a number of years ago with my colleague Ralph Schroeder. I'll, I'll mention Ralph a couple of times. He and I write all kinds of stuff together. The interesting thing about Ralph, you won't get to meet him here. He'll be in um, Christchurch later this spring. He's, he's a visitor there in the spring. So if you happen to be down in Christchurch and want to meet Ralph. Um, if he were here, it's quite entertaining when we speak together because we don't agree on anything. We disagree on practically everything we, we ever talk about. But we work really get good together because of that, because we have to hone our arguments to be able to convince the other one to get a word down on the page. We have to really think through every single word until we've got, got a sentence that we are both willing to put on page. So our, our articles are, and our book particularly is well thought through in terms of what we've actually said rather than being lazy about it. So, so we disagree on things, but here's one of our, our images from this, this 2009 paper that is part of a bigger image that you'll see in just a second, which it says, you know, here's a naive view of traditional research. This is very simplified and oversimplistic. You've got researchers down here doing traditional research. They publish stuff. Libraries come into this because they interact with uh, publishers and the journals that they're collecting. Um, academics, who are also these people, come back into it when they read the journals and they feed back into the research results. So you get this very simple little feedback loop. Um, and then there's also this, this path out here into the larger public understanding of science, but it's very tightly controlled, right? It, it's through science media, science outlets, um, popular science outlets that, that you're familiar with, some of the media programs and so, so forth. Now this is an old view and overly simplistic, but it's something that we relied on to build this bigger picture, which is a more modern view of what the information ecosystem looks like. And I'll talk about a couple different areas of this diagram today. So I'll talk about this top left here in just a few minutes, and then later on in the talk, I'll talk about this area up in the top right. But essentially, we've got a much more complex space. And maybe it was always more complex than we were making it out, but it's certainly more complex today when you've got all these different players going on in terms of different ways of accessing scholarly communication and talking with each other, whether it's blogs or whether it's Twitter, or you know, some people might be tweeting about this right now. Um, and certainly, it's a more complex area of who's able to find and see this stuff that we're writing about as academics. So this is the book, Knowledge Machines, Digital Transformations in the Sciences and Humanities. It's been out since 2015, and many of the things I'll talk about today, not everything, but many of the things I'll talk about today are in that book, so if you'd like to pick up a copy, you can. I got very lucky on the day I grabbed the screenshot. We were the number one new release on Amazon, which was quite exciting. Um, it's not true anymore. That was quite a long time ago. 
So what about this top left corner of this diagram? <laughs> this area that we call e-research. How many of you have even heard the word e-research? It's kind of a few people, oh, pretty good actually. That's better than some, some audiences I do this to. E-research used to be um, quite a common parlance, particularly in the UK. There was a lot of investment in this area of e-science and e-research and what they called in the US cyber infrastructure in the first decade of the 21st century. And we were heavily engaged in this, Ralph and I and my colleague Bill Dutton and some others at Oxford and around the UK in this thing called the, um, the UK e-science and e-social science program. And what was happening during the sea science era was they were trying to embed computational approaches to doing science, social science, and later the humanities. And some of the ways that they were talking about doing that was grid computing, federated data sets, cloud computing, and so forth, and building these tools that would let distributed teams and researchers share tools and data to be able to do new kinds of research. So this is our definition from the book. E-research is research using digital tools and data, the things that many of you here are interested in. For the distributed and collaborative, so it's spread out and it works to, it's about working together, not just working on your own. Production of knowledge, so making new claims about the world and making that in a way that can be shared and maintained over many years. Now, again, this is from the book. A, so the, the data originally ends in 2012 because that's when we were done writing the book. It took, publishers are so slow. It took three years before we, from when we finished the book for it actually to appear in print. Um, quite frustrating, but anyway. You can see that there's this, a number of different terms. These are, it's not just these terms, it's a com compilation of terms. You can see the whole search thing in the book if you're interested in that. Um, on a bunch of different collaborative computing topics. And you can see there's this inflection point starting here around 2003 where a lot of stuff really started to take off. And this is not accidental. This is because of the funding efforts that were going on in the UK, in the US, in Australia. Um, there was a bit in New Zealand. Um, but also some other places around the world that were spending new money on building these e-research infrastructures and getting people to use grid computing and cloud computing and everything else. And so we saw this big takeoff in 2003, and then it peaks up here around 2010. Now this slight drop off actually is when all the funding stopped. And people n didn't necessarily stop doing these things, but they stopped talking about them in the ways that they've been talking about them for a number of years. Now I've left a little bit of space over here because this bottom line here, big data, which looks pretty small, up through 2011 when there's this slight tick. In 2010, nobody knew about big data. Nobody talked about big data, nobody cared about big data. Um, I've looked at the, more later, the later years for big data re references in academic publications and it takes off like mad. It's even bigger if you look in the popular media. And so I'll talk a little bit about big data today and what that means for research. Now, data is an interesting thing to some people, but if you had a conference on data up till 2011, you got a room like this. A couple of bored people checking their mobile phones, not really caring that much. It was, I, I was at meetings about data and this is what they looked like. Suddenly in 2011, and I can't tell you exactly what happened, but suddenly everybody got interested in big data. It had to do with things like the Snowden revelations. It had to do with the increasing awareness of the kinds of things that were being collected about us online. But suddenly big data became sexy. And when you have topic conferences now about big data, you get packed out rooms. This was a, at the ICA in 2012, a session I ran on big data, and people were out in the hallway trying to fight their way into the room because suddenly when it was big data, everybody cares. Um, and this gives us a new opportunity to think about what we can do with data in different disciplines. Now, what I'm gonna do for the next half an hour or so is give you a couple of examples that come from our book and our other work and some of our other projects that aren't in the book that talk about the fact that in an increasingly interdisciplinary world, as I said at the beginning, I live in an interdisciplinary world at the OII, but like it or not, disciplines still matter. Most people are trained into thinking about the world in disciplinary ways, they learn how what the rules of the world are very early on. I remember once we did a project where we worked with some second year undergraduates at a college in London, and these history students had taken on all of the, not only language, but the biases of their faculty members in their second year of undergraduate. They had somehow gotten in their heads that digital things were dirty, that you should hide the fact that you've done anything digital. Um, we were asking these students and we said, well, you know, do you use Wikipedia? And they, they sort of, you know, look around. Well, yeah, but don't tell anybody. Um, and 
the, when, when we asked them about when they would build their list of references at the end of their papers, we said, well, do you cite things in a digital, you know, do you indicate that they came from a digital resource? And they said, well, you know, I get all my stuff through digital resources, but I would never do that. If I've built my list of references and there seem like there's too many URLs, I just delete some until it looks like I've done real work. Um, because somehow sitting at the computer isn't real work. So these kinds of disciplinary norms are trained into us quite early. We see this again and again when we look at some of these examples that I'll talk about today. So I've got about two examples from each of these areas of sciences, social sciences, humanities, and arts. These are very brief versions of all these. I could talk for an hour about each of these, but I won't be, be a Fidel Castro sort of afternoon here and keep you until midnight talking about the different cases. Um, but I'll give you just a brief overview of some of these things. So two quick examples from the sciences. Now, before I start on these, I want to talk a little bit about this scientific styles work that we rely on in the book, which is based on Ian Hacking, who's a, a histor historian of science. And um, he based this on an earlier philosopher of science called Crombie. And he argues that there are essentially six, possibly more, but you know, it's debatable, scientific styles that you can break most science down into. This doesn't necessarily include everything in the humanities, but we'll argue that certainly some things in the humanities can also fit into this. Um, and I won't go into these in great detail. I can, I can, you, there, there are plenty of sources that talk about these. But you know, some things like taxonomic just means sorting things out. This is what a lot of people in libraries and archives do, is sort things out and build the taxonomies and keep track of things. And you'll see a couple of examples of that in science today. Also, probability is pretty self-explanatory and modeling and so forth. So we'll come back to a couple of these as we go. So my first example is from a pro project I did with marine biologists. And I brought this example today, even though the, the project now is going back over a decade, um, it I think is of interest in New Zealand in particular because actually some of the scientists we worked with, their research field stations were in Kaikoura, um, working with dolphins. Now, any of you who are familiar with marine biology might know that one of the ways that marine mammals are identified is through photographs of various identifying features. So for whales, it's the tail. For humpback whales, at least, it's the tail. For blue whales, it's patterns on the side. For dolphins, it's the nicks and notches in the, in the dorsal fin. And these, you can take a picture of a humpback whale, for instance. It's like a fingerprint if you get the tail at the right angle. And then you can identify that whale in the future. So here's an example of a humpback whale. And this one, you can see, is the same animal. Obviously, right? This one actually is pretty obvious. Anyone see the obvious feature on this one? That one's, these little dots there are really a dead giveaway on this particular one. Um, but also you look at the shape, the coloration, the, the nicks and notches on the trailing edge, but this is the same animal. Um, it was viewed in two different locations, 2004, 2005, by two different people in different places around the Pacific Ocean. And this photo identification lets you say with certainty that this is the same animal over a period of time. Now, the humpback whales won't ever get fewer features. They might get more because you know, they'll get bitten by stuff or they'll get hit by boats and so forth, but they won't get fewer. So you can do this quite effectively. Now, one of the things I was interested in this project was understanding the practices of photo identification as they switch from film to digital. So they've been up until 2002 using film cameras to do all this work. And in between 2002 and 2003, essentially the entire discipline switched to di digital cameras in a very short order, as digital cameras got a certain amount of capabilities that were um, consistent with what they were doing. And one of the questions I was asking was, well, what is the meaning of this switch that seems on the surface quite simple, right? A digital SLR and a film SLR look identical. They essentially work almost identically. You take the expensive lens off of one and you put it on the other one and you're good to go, right? It shouldn't really cause that much disruption, but of course it does. Um, now here's a matching technique on screen. Uh, so this is some dolphins, obviously, not whales. Um, and they've got a, some algorithms that sort them out into different characteristics, and they can say, okay, I've got a new dolphin fin. Let me bring up the ones that might be matches and then visually match this myself. Now, well, this is one of the things that computers still largely aren't all that great at, is doing this kind of pattern recognition, and human brains are better at. This is tedious work. So this is one of the matchers at a place in Washington State in the US, who was part of the splash project that I was talking about with the population levels and abundance of humpbacks. And this is her full-time job, 40 hours a week, matching whale tails to pictures of whale tails. 
it's quite difficult work, as you can imagine. Um, there were four women, it just happened to be women at the time, doing this, uh, no, no structural reason that had to be, but there are more women in marine biology than men. And four, four relatively recent uh, graduates who were spending 40 hours a week doing this, they all had different strategies. Um, they all did things like one I know only parked at two hour meters, so she had to get up and move her car every two hours and get a bit of blood flowing. Um, but the other interesting thing is they all used a different mental algorithm for how to match a whale tail. There wasn't a single algorithm they all used. So one would look at the trailing edge first, and one would look at the coloration patterns first, and one would look at other features first. They, and when I talked to the manager of this group, he said, well, yeah, it's very difficult to predict. I just have to throw people in and see if they're any good at it. Some people are terrible and they never do anything and they can't match anything. Others just take to it like that. And they can match stuff really quickly because they've got some sort of built-in ability to see these patterns. Now, these are all printed out, but they're digital images. They've taken digital images with digital cameras. And they printed them out in these books. Um, they've got bunches of these things. And what they're doing here is, this is back to our styles of science, is they're doing this taxonomy. They're taking all the pictures from individual marine biologists. They're sorting them into photographs, building this database, and then you can do science with it. Then you can ask questions. So this is the first step in being able to do science. And one of the basic scientific questions was, how many humpbacks live in the Pacific Ocean? Because up until this time, they had no idea. This work was being done by, so, so the splash project included pictures from 500 different groups of people around the Pacific Rim. Uh, and they were sending photographs to four central locations, which were then being sent to this one central location to do matching across the Pacific Ocean. Before you could have matched individual animals that came to your same spot and you took pictures of it year on year, but you couldn't know where they were the rest of the time. So this was printed in National Geographic magazine in 2007, and they were finally able to answer this very basic question of science, which is about how many humpbacks live in the Pacific Ocean. The answer is about 15 to 20,000 based on this work. And now they've got some sort of baseline going forward. Now, the reason I bring this up is not just because it's a really interesting case that I really had tons of fun doing this work. I got to hang out on boats and look at whales and dolphins and so forth. Um, quite, quite a fun way of doing research, I must say. But it also raises interesting questions about preservation of data. So how many people in this room know how long a humpback whale lives? Ah, good, nobody's a liar, because nobody knows how long a humpback whale lives. <laughs> <laughs> The answer to how long a humpback whale lives is so far, it's longer than scientists have been studying humpback whales. They found a humpback whale washed up on a beach in about 2007, I believe, that had a harpoon point in it that was used by a company that went out of business in 1891. So they know that that whale had been swimming around since at least 1890 and got harpooned at some point and then kept swimming for the next 120 years. So they live a long time. They live much longer than the life of an individual scientist. So the data that I'm collecting as a scientist today is not only of value to me, it's of value to generations after me. But one of the things that they're struggling with in this field is how do I make that data available to the generations after me when I don't have a joined up information system, I don't have a way of sharing this data that really works. I've been mostly working at a small scale in individual groups. So this is something they've been struggling with and they continue to struggle with, is how to make sure that data that could be valuable for, for centuries is of, of use when the time comes about. We certainly hope that the whales are still around in 100 and plus years. It also raises an interesting issue also for archivists is what constitutes digital data? That's digital data. These are digital photographs of blue whales. They're stored in a box. We got our box down here. We got our box lover, Richard, earlier. Um, this is a very, very simple staples and lid that they've taped together. And the reason that this, these pictures, so the, the rubber bands, this is an individual sightings of, an, of a new, a, of an animal. When they find a new individual sighting, they'll put it in the rubber band and store it in a little packet and keep track of it in a separate database that they've got a record of these things. But the reason that these are in a box, and you can see that they've categorized it as mostly dark here, is because this was quite a small project for this organization. Their bigger project was the humpback one, and they had an elaborate database, and they had everything being kept digitally for that one, but they didn't have much money for the blue whale project, and so they had to resort to what they could in order to manage and store this data. But then if you're going to make this available long-term, what is the, the archival strategy for making these data 
available to blue whale researchers down the road. It's not immediately clear. So let me go on to another couple of examples. I spend a little bit of time on that one just because it's one of my favorites. Um, it always is with the whales. But other ways of thinking about uh, another example of scientific research has to do with some of the genetic work. I used to work in genetics, uh, bipolar disorder genetics, many years ago when I was in Indiana. And some of the, the scientific structures that are being set up here have to do with collecting data from various research teams, sharing these blood and phenotypic databases, building federated databases, and then being able to share these around the world. And my example for this has to do with some work we did with the OECD on big data for advancing dementia research. Now, it's interesting, back to my point of big data somehow being sexy, I'll give you a, clue, a, a little insider bit of tip. This project really had nothing to do with big data. The data is not that big. But the funders insisted that we include the word big data in the title. <laughs> so there you have it. I mean, one of, one of the databases that um, we were working with here, ADNI, they had less than 1,000 subjects that they were dealing with. Not that big a data, actually. But because big data was seen as sexy, we had to put it in. So there it is. But you can read this as data for advancing dementia research. Now, those of you who know about dementia, hopefully, uh, I'm sure there's some people who sadly in the audience know about it from personal experience with relatives and so forth. But dementia is a, is a devastating disease that causes lots of problems. And this certainly came up in 2013 when there was a then G8, now G7 um, organization meeting about dementia. And some people may remember uh, this guy who used to be a prime minister in the UK. Um, he's since slunk off to do whatever he's doing these days. Um, but one of the things that he did do that was interesting and good was he got the G8 thinking about dementia research. And he put together this, got these people together for this dementia summit, summit and was interested in a number of things, particularly this third point, which was this awareness that a lack of collaboration and openness with different scientists around the world using different data and trying different approaches, but frankly, not really working together enough. One of the huge challenges in a lot of uh, medical research is the fact that the sample sizes need to be bigger in order to be able to detect any differences. In the bipolar studies I used to be involved in, we kept scaling up and up and up. We started with you know, hundreds of families, then went to thousands of families, then went to tens of thousands of, of individuals to try and find signals that would indicate which genes were responsible for bipolar disorder. The same is true for dementia. Essentially, we don't know exactly what causes dementia. We certainly don't know exactly how to treat dementia. And if you're going to come up with answers to this, you've got to start sharing globally rather than being based in just a small area, which is how scientists are trained. Back to this question I raised earlier about the disciplinary differences. When you're in medical science, you're trained that your data is very valuable. You don't want to get scooped, and you want to be able to wrest as much value out of your data as you can before you give it off to other people. So we worked with the OECD on this, and we came up with this diagram that goes all, all credit goes to my um, research assistant, Ulrika Dietjen, who came up with this, which was trying to understand some of the structural challenges to data sharing for dementia researchers. And you can see there's some things the ice, above the water here on our, our little iceberg, which are the technical challenges, which are, are sort of fixable, not that actually difficult, quite frankly. Um, there's this consent challenge, which has to do with the fact that if I've given you some biological material or giving you an interview here in New Zealand, and I've, the researchers followed whatever protocols are in place in New Zealand, that doesn't necessarily allow that researcher to then share it with a researcher in another country where the laws might be different, where the rules about consent can be different. And so there's a lot of barriers to sharing data outside country settings. Um, and that, that is just true around the world. But then there's these other underscore underlying structural challenges about people and processes. And this is some of the social informatics questions, is how do we change the incentives in medical science to make sure that people have a, are, are given incentive not just to create data, but to create data in a way that's reusable? How many of you have worked with a scientist who comes to you possibly at the end of the project and says, oh, I got all this data and I'm supposed to put it in a repository somewhere and I, I, I I haven't really thought about how to do that. I don't have any money left. The project's over. Could you help me shove this together somewhere and stick it someplace so I've, I fulfill the requirements of my funder? I hear enough laughs that uh, has happened to some of you. Um, of course, then it's very late in the game, and we need to change people's thinking so that they start to think about these things early on so that they make the choices when they're gathering data and, and working with data so that it can be shared. Um, there's a lot of other things in here. I can refer you to the report. But I think just this idea that we need to change our way of thinking collaboratively is important in the sciences. We tend to 
have a, a tendency to idolize the sciences and think that they've got, they've got collaboration all sorted out. You know, physicists and astronomers, they've got sharing and all this kind of thing sorted out. They've worked it out when they build things like CERN. But there's a, still a lot of structural impediments to sharing data, even when the, the stakes are so high as with dementia. Now, what is big data or data in the dementia space? Well, these are the kinds of data that researchers are used to. Purposely collective data, this is what they've always done. They go out, they get samples, they, they work with people, they, they interview them. Um, and increasingly, they're using routine data for medical systems. So this is administrative data, data about admissions. I was talking with a, a insurance company in the US that's one of these companies you've, you've never heard of, but they own 20 companies that you have heard of. Um, and they were working with the data from all these 20 companies to try and say, okay, if we've got someone that's got a diagnosis of dementia at age 85, can we look back at their medical claims 10, 20, 30, 40 years earlier and see if we can detect patterns of what's happened in their life that would predict whether they're gonna come down with dementia? So we're increasingly using routine data, but there's a whole new area that's unexplored and really raises challenges in terms of how one preserves these data, which is non-medical data. Because you can do interesting things with these potentially. We're not largely not yet. But loyalty card, mobile data, I mean, you've got countdown cards. Um, these are examples from the UK, because I'm from the UK. Um, or online engagement data, the things people do online, the kinds of stuff we can scrape from people's activities online. I was talking with uh, Clive Hunby of the company Dunn Hunby, which made this thing called the Tesco Club Card, uh, which was right there. And he was saying, you know, we can actually do some interesting things with people's shopping habits, which is I can start to detect that people are doing the things that we can know, we know that dementia patients start to do, which is they make a narrow range of choices in their life. They buy fewer kinds of things. They'll go to the store every day and buy the same thing over and over, even though we know they couldn't have eaten all those in the time that intervened. So they'll go to the store, they'll remember, oh, I like this kind of biscuit, and they'll buy one, and then they'll get home and they'll find that there's a hundred, hundred of them in their cupboard. Um, so you can start to potentially detect these things in people's shopping habits, but then how ethically does Tesco or Countdown or anybody else share that data with a medical researcher that doesn't violate people's privacy but does help us advance our understanding and potentially our ability to, to help the people who are suffering from this? It's a completely uncharted space, but it opens a large potential for being able to do interesting new things. So big data is about these traces we leave everywhere. And this is what I'll segue in just a second into the social sciences. Certainly many of you, probably all of you in this room have some kind of mobile phone on you that knows exactly where you are um, at all times. Uh, increasingly, some of us will be driving self-driving cars that will know exactly where it's taking us and what our habits are. Um, whenever you spend anything, retailers know all sorts of things about you. How many people recognize that thing there? Yeah, what is it? So it's an RFID tag. Um, do our badges have these on the back? Are you tracking us now? I've been to conferences before that have these RFID badges on the back, and I'll usually go to the conference organizer and say, so, what are you tracking? Um, what are you doing with this data? And if they don't know, I just tear it off and throw it away. Um, <laughs> but increasingly, these kinds of tags and ways of tracking us are out there and being able to know things about us. And the question is, can we use these in ways to advance science without infringing upon people's personal liberties and their rights to have their privacy respected. Some of you probably saw this example that scares people. Um, Target is an American retailer. How many people saw this example a couple years ago? So about a third of the room, so I can tell the rest. So this happened in 2012 and was reported in Forbes and New York Times and other sorts of things. It said Target figured out someone was pregnant. And okay, they, they do this by looking at the purchases you make, you buy unscented hand creams, you buy other combinations of stuff. So by the second trimester, an organization like Target can know that you're probably pregnant if you're a female and you're doing these kinds of purchases. They know this from mining everybody's activities. You've all gotten this happening to you and you're offered coupons in order to save money and they're quite accurate. Or when you've gone to Amazon and it suggests a certain kind of purchases based on your past purchases. Now what freaks everybody out, of course, is this part of the title that they figured out a teen girl was pregnant before her father knew. And the father said, Target, why are you sending my 15-year-old daughter, or 16-year-old daughter, however she was, coupons for, for nappies? And it turns out Target knew a lot more than the father did. The, the teen daughter was pregnant and hadn't told her parents yet. And people start to then worry, wait a minute, 
how is this big data shaping what we are able to know about our own families in the world when a retailer knows more than, than I do about my own family? So it raises some interesting questions when we combine the National Health Service in the UK with something like ClubGuard. What does that lead to in terms of research and what does it mean for the organizations that are meant to do something with this data to make it reusable in the future? Uh, it's one thing if the researcher that I mentioned earlier who comes to you and says, yeah, I've got this data, could you please sort it out and store it someplace? Also says, oh yeah, and by the way, a whole pile of the data is a proprietary data set from a private retailer that has this huge non-disclosure agreement attached to it that they made a sign before they would give us anything. Uh, can you please sort that out for me? You know, that as a whole layer of complexity toward being able to do anything with these data down the road. And it really um, has some profound implications for how science is done if we can't share these sort of proprietary data. Okay, so two quick examples from the social sciences. Um, about the ways that we're using things like the internet. This first example I'll give very quickly, this is from one of our articles that was just published this year, that we published in the, on the occasion of the 25th anniversary of the web. Um, and we were looking at how the internet has become embedded in different kinds of research. For those of you who took my workshop um, yesterday morning, you'll recognize these diagrams. For the rest of you, I'll explain it quick, quite quickly. These diagrams, the, the sort of gray dots or whatever color they are, um, represent all of science as indicated, as represented on the database Scopus. Um, these were created by a colleague of mine named Lute Ledesdorf, who's in the Netherlands, and it's based on 50 years of journal citations to each other. So if journals cite each other a lot, they're probably pretty close, they're probably in the same areas. And then you overlay a, a, a new research topic onto these to see how it spreads across the different disciplines. So this is the internet as a research um, area of research or a contributor to research in different disciplines. And you can see 1990, it's you know, sort of scattered all over the place. By 1995, the social sciences are down here, the humanities are down in this little tail, um, medicine's over here, this is sort of science and engineering and maths up there. It's starting to really spread across all disciplines till 2015 when the internet is being showing up in all kinds of publications across all disciplines. It's really pervasive of the way knowledge is being generated. And this is obviously of interest to someone like me who's interested in how knowledge changes and grows, but it's also interesting to anybody in these disciplines who stops to think about the fact that the internet really has become a central part of what happens across all disciplines in a way that some of us were able to predict 25 years ago, but certainly not everybody was able to predict. You know, my uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee, who was mentioned in the previous talk, he's um, recently taken up an appointment at Oxford and you know, one of the interesting things about the World Wide Web is when you, when you meet Sir Tim, you have to wonder, I mean, he's, he's got genius certainly, but you wonder whether the insight into creating the World Wide Web was a result of his genius at seeing how the world should work or just the fact that that's actually how his brain works. Um, when you hear him talk, it's very nonlinear. He, he, he sort of bounces off in different directions as he follows links in his own mind as he's speaking. And so in some ways, what we've created on the World Wide Web is the internal workings of Tim Berners-Lee's brain, <laughs> which is, is quite liberating and exciting because he's, he is a genius, but it has caused us to also start to think in these ways as we start to think about these connections around the world rather than in linear ways of going to a library or a museum and asking someone to give us the answer on something. We're taken off in all these various directions. And then one other quick example from the social sciences um, has to do with web archives. And I brought this example just because some of you in this room may have dealt with web archives. Anybody here worked with web archives at all? One or two, a few? Okay, a few scattered around. Um, web archives are deeply frustrating to me. I've been working with them for a number of years. I had a project in 2009 with the Internet Archive in San Francisco, who some of you may have heard of. They make this way back machine. Um, Brewster Kale is the person who started the Internet Archive. He made money in the tech industry and used some of that money to set up the Internet Archive, which he was quite prescient in 1996 that said, oh look, the Internet's a thing. Uh, this stuff disappears quite quickly. Maybe somebody should be grabbing it and storing it in case we ever want to refer to this stuff in the future. Um, they've done this on a relatively tight budget. So it goes out and it crawls the web periodically and it gets these examples. You can go to the Internet Archive Wayback Machine. Presumably some of you have used the Wayback Machine. And if you know an old web page, you can find the different snapshots that have been taken of that. So you can see what, um, I guess I should have done this for today's talk, you know, what did Tape Papa's website look like in different times over the past. Now, that's great if you want to look at things individually, but if you want to look at things 
in any sort of bigger way, the interface doesn't allow that. It just allows you to put in a single URL. So we've been working with the British Library and others in the UK Web Archive to try and do some things like build search interfaces. The, the Internet Archive doesn't have a search interface largely because they can't index it as quickly as the data comes in. So they, there's no way to keep the search uh, index up to date. Um, or some of these advanced search tools. This was from a project, and this slide is uh, courtesy of one of my research assistants, um, that we were working with the British Library to come up with some more ways to search within the resources being held in the web archives. Now, there's a huge problem with the web archives in the UK and within some other countries in that the legislation that allows the British Library and the other depository libraries to actually gather web archive data in the UK only allows there to be one copy on one machine usable in the library. Okay, well that's good if you wanna go look up individual pages, but if you wanna do anything programmatically with that, it's extremely difficult. So we've been working with them um, at the Alan Turing Institute actually that I mentioned at the beginning on how to use computation without breaking the law, but can let us still answer interesting questions of this data that now spans 25 years because historians of the future will want to know what was going on on the web today because this is where so much is happening of what we're doing in the world. So this was one of the first projects using any sort of uh, computational approach to the web archives. This was with my colleagues. Uh, Scott Hale was one of my former doctoral students. He's now a researcher at the OII. Taha Yasseri, Josh Cowles, and, and other colleagues. And we just tried to map the UK web space using the links between pages on the web. So you can see this is you know, very simple data, but we were the first ones who ever did this, and this was only 2014, which says something. Um, so this is the growth of different, you know, co.org.ac, which is the academic domain, and .gov in the UK over time. And this is obviously a logarithmic scale, so it, it you know, grows logarithmically. But essentially by 2003, everybody who was going to be on the web was on the web. So the, the web was saturated with the organizations and so forth by 2003. And you can look at the relative sector size. The academic sector had a much larger proportion, even though com was all, or the, uh, the commercial sector was always the biggest. Um, academic had a much larger proportion, so even though it grew a little bit, it got, you know, disappeared in terms of the overall volume of web pages. And this was a little interesting bit we did out of this paper, which said, okay, how do these sectors link to each other? And so this is normalized, otherwise the co co just ends up dwarfing everything else. Um, but which sectors link? And so the outside color shows you the, the, the curve going from that domain to something else. So you can see that Co sends a lot of things over here to Gov. So they send links over to Gov. Um, Gov doesn't send lots of links to too many other people other than other government institutions. Um, <laughs> academics quite like to link to ourselves. So this is academics <laughs> linking right back to themselves. And they link out to government, but government, uh, let's see, doesn't send much of anything back over here to academics. So they don't care what, there's, there's government sending things back to academics is a little tiny one. So this lets us understand some basic questions about who's connected to who on the web. Very simple stuff. We're now trying to extend this and answer these bigger questions about how it's grown. This, and there's pictures for this over the various years of the, the sample. Okay, so those are quick examples from the social sciences, but moving on also to the humanities, which some of you are probably interested in. Um, I'll give you this one quick example that comes from my colleague Ralph's work um, about Pinchon Wiki. I don't know if any of you are fans of the American uh, novelist Thomas Pinchon. If you are, you know that he writes these very dense novels that have lots of hidden meaning in them. There's lots of layers of, of meaning. And when he wrote his book Against the Day, or was about to publish his book Against the Day, um, a, a, a chap who's, whose name is now eluding me in California thought, oh, we should annotate this. You know, there had been a previous annotation of Gravity's Rainbow, and this took about 10 years for Weisenberger with 22 contributors to write. And the Pinchon wiki was set up to say, could we do this maybe a bit quicker than 10 years so we can use this annotation more quickly? So they did. They set it up. They got a bunch of contributors, and they were able to annotate all of Against the Day in about three months. And you know, through a number of spot checks of different kinds of quality measures, essentially, it was a really high quality annotation. They've since gone back and annotated a lot of Pinchon's other novels and also pre you know, novels subsequently. And they, this is, raises an interesting point of a new way of doing a humanities task, which is annotating a complex novel, can be done by a crowd and can be done quite effectively by a crowd. Um, but this wiki, this was done by a non-academic. He was just an enthusiast. 
this, the machine running it is sitting under his desk. It's a sort of crappy old machine that he had lying around that could, could run a piece of wiki software. Um, you know, there, there was no plan at all for what the lifespan of this might be if it were to disappear, if he, if he lost his ability to run it or the machine broke down. And I think it raises interesting questions. So if you've got a valuable resource like this, you know, Weisenberger's Gravity's Rainbow, libraries purchased, they had them on their shelves, they stored them, people could access them down the road. I can't make you any guarantee that this resource will still be available in 20 years' time if someone wants to go back and consult it, except through some archive someplace. So again, one of our pictures here, the Pinch on Wiki is also showing this taxonomic behavior where you've got an author who writes a book, different annotators are sorting that into different buckets, adding additional information, and then making it available for readers and researchers to use. And then one other example from the humanity space is this whole area of discovery and how we're finding out about information. This comes from a couple of different projects that we did with this thing called the Research Information Network. And we were looking at humanities information practices, and I'll briefly talk about scientific information practices as well. And we were interested in a number of things in these studies. You know, there's lots of stuff in the report that you can look at. But one of the questions had to do with, um, and this was 2011, um, was there becoming a Googleopoly? You know, did Google just own all search and could the rest of us just pack up our bags and go home and leave it all to Google because they would sort it out all for us? And, oops, ah. Uh, when we did a survey of some of these people, we found that 79% considered Google to be an important resource and 66% considered Google Scholar to be an important resource. It's pretty big. But also there were a lot of other things that people considered to be important resources. Visiting libraries, browsing library materials online, following citations, um, and this bottom one of consulting peers and experts. People still rely on each other to know what's important. If they've got a new topic in their mind and they want to find out more about that, they go and they talk to someone they trust down the hallway or around the world via email or Skype. Now this isn't true of just the humanities. Um, let me skip past this and go to the physical scientists. We also ask the same questions of physical scientists. They use Google a bit more, but they also rely heavily on peers and experts. The one thing the physical scientists don't think they do is use libraries. So browsing library materials in person, only 14%. Searches of library materials, 16%. And we asked a lot of them questions about this. They said, oh yeah, I don't use libraries. I know I've been a librarian in decades. Um, and then we said, well, how do you get the journals you get? And they, oh, they just appear. I don't know where they come from. Um, <laughs> And we said, well, you know, it might be your library providing that. Well, I guess I did, you know, when I travel, I can't get access to some of these things. So maybe that somebody's providing, but I don't know who it is. Um, but they, did, they didn't think that libraries were even a remote part of their lives. They were completely divorced from what libraries were doing, even though libraries were providing a lot of this access. And it raises an interesting question for organizations like libraries and other member institutions, is over the last 20 years, many libraries have gotten too good at becoming invisible. We've made our services so transparent that people forget that they're even using them, which is good on one level because you can just, if you're on a, a network that's got access to something, you click and it gives you an article or a result or a, 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 a subscription-based resource. But if you're making that too invisible, then people don't think that they're using these resources at all. And then to wrap up before I give my couple, couple of final slides, two quick examples from the arts that I think are interesting. And this is work that I largely do for fun just because I like the arts. I've got a background in the arts. And so I, I often do these projects quite cheaply because I'm willing to participate for practically nothing just to have some fun. So this is something some of you might have heard of, Bitcoin, right? Uh, this is a, a cover of a rather weirdly designed magazine talking about Bitcoin and this whole notion of, of Bitcoin. And I won't go into any great detail about how Bitcoin works. For those of you who are interested, you can talk to me during a break. But essentially, it uses this thing called the blockchain. And you're to be forgiven if you don't understand much about it. Up to a year ago, I didn't understand anything about it. But my colleague, Vili Leidenwert, has done a lot of training to teach me what I'm talking about. Um, essentially, what the blockchain lets you do is store records in a public space that anybody can see that a record has been changed, updated, happened, owned, whatever. Um, they can't necessarily see the content of that, but they can see that the transaction happened. And this is all done in public and visibly. Rather than a database being a private thing that only one person can see and control, anybody can see it and they can see that the transactions have happened. Now this is interesting in the art world as it turns out. So I work with this organization called DAX. This is a London-based organization that it's one of these organizations that the name doesn't technically mean what it used to mean. It used to mean Design and Artist Copyright Society, but now it's just DAX is DAX. It doesn't mean that anymore. Um, and what they do is they help artists get the payments that they deserve because of their art. 
And so they, they're designed by artists, for artists. I've been working with them for a number of years. And the CIO of, or CEO of DAX called me up a number of months ago and said, I need some of your time, Eric. I need to understand this blockchain stuff. And at the time, I didn't understand. I said, okay, Jelaine, well, I'll do what I can. And we've been working with them since to think about how blockchain might be used in the art world to be able to solve some of their problems. Because some of these problems are things that I hadn't even thought about. So they've got some things in the UK. Again, apologies for having mostly UK examples, but that's where I work. Um, this artist resale right. Has your work been resold on the art market for $1,000 or more? In the UK, or 1,000 pounds or more, or euros, whatever it is. Um, you've got a right as an artist to get some of that income if someone resells your painting on, and that's owed to you or to your estate. Um, but actually tracking that down and making these payments available to artists is quite a tricky thing. And so the question being asked is, can blockchain make this more transparent and more able to track over time that these sorts of things are happening? Because if we've got a blockchain record attached to a piece of artwork, when it sells and the blockchain records that that transaction has happened and that that piece of artwork has been sold as a matter of practice for the provenance of that piece of art, then the payment that's owed to the artist can automatically flow to the artist through the blockchain. It's quite enticing in some ways, but of course, there's a lot between here and there actually happening in terms of changing behaviors of artists, changing behaviors of art markets, and so forth. Likewise with um, estates, again, something I hadn't even remotely thought about until Jillian was teaching me about it. When an artist is alive, getting the money to them is a relatively straightforward thing if, you, if they know money's owed to them, but the minute they die, life becomes much more complicated for an organization like DAX because many artists have very complex estates and money that comes to the estate might be distributed amongst many people in different fractional amounts. And so it could be, you know, a child gets this much, but some nephew gets a, another fraction of a percent. And can they use blockchain to start to sort out these fractional payments that are moving out across, the way, uh, across a large group of people or organizations? This is something actually blockchain is very good at, but is just moving into this space. So um, we're working with this organization that makes this thing called Ascribe. They're called Big Chain DB now. Um, also another organization called Verisart that are trying to build these technologies, but they're building them in a way, and we're working with them to say, will this actually work for artists themselves? And then my last example, which I bring up just because, again, it's fun, um, about how young people learn to collaborate with digital tools. So this was a project I did with a couple of colleagues down in Swindon who are filmmakers, and we worked with a group of school kids to make films using nothing but an iPad. So they, the, the, the Keith Phillips, who was one of the co-authors on this little report, um, he's a filmmaker and he's been going to schools for years teaching students how to make films with you know, big digital camera, big video cameras and things. And we said, what if we just gave him iPads, nothing else? iPads with a bit of software on it and said, you know, here are the tools for storytelling. Can you make a film? doing this in a few weeks' time. And so we worked with these students, and it was amazing what happened, which was it really unleashed a lot of creativity amongst these students. So previously, when Keith had worked with these students, you know, there would be someone who was the camera person, and they would look through the viewfinder, and they would see what was going on. Well, suddenly, if you're using an iPad to film, everybody behind that person can also see what's going on and can start to see the choices that the filmmaker's making and can, when the shot's over, give them feedback and discuss these sorts of things. They were doing the editing back in the room on the big screen with the iPads. So they were seeing the editing choices that were being made. And they were making a lot of really interesting collaborative choices as a group of young artists or young just people to understand how the world worked using this new digital technology. One of the films was actually invited to a, uh, a, a, a international competition. Okay, so so what? My last couple of slides. What's the point of all this? So it used to be the case that finding stuff out was a huge um, skill needed in the world. So when I was an 11-year-old boy in rural Ohio, that's the town where I grew up, and the Bank of Elmore, the little town I grew up in, um, we had a teacher who gave us this thing called question of the day. And the question of the day was usually a question that was something you couldn't go find in our little inadequate school library. It was something you had to sort of ferret out an answer to. And one of the questions was, whose portrait is on the $100 bill? And in 1977, in small town America, there weren't a lot of $100 bills lying around. I'd never seen one in my life. Most people I knew had never seen one. And so I actually had to go to this bank and ask a teller, could I see a $100 bill because I'd like to know what it looked like. And she referred me to the vice president of the bank and I went and sat at his desk. And we, he took me into the vault and we got out a $100 bill and he showed it to me. 
and I found out my answer. Now, of course, if you ask 11-year-old kids today that question, it's a matter of seconds before they know the answer to the question. It's not any skill to be able to find the answer that Benjamin Franklin is on the $100 bill. It's so simple to find information. The question is, what can we do with that information that's out there? What can we do to analyze this, this data, this information? And I think this is the new skill that we need to be thinking about. Now, one of the questions it raises is whether, whether the easy availability of certain data will really bias the kinds of research we do. A lot of my colleagues do things with Flickr and Twitter and YouTube and so forth. Um, and I talked a little bit about this in my workshop. But will this mean we only study things that are on Flickr and YouTube and, 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 and Twitter, for instance, even though that might not be where the most interesting questions lie? And also, we've got a big challenge as we move from um, this area that I, won't, I don't have time to really focus on, but science, um, whether we rely on each other and whether we're certain what we ought to do. So this is physicists. They rely on each other a lot to build the Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland, and they know what they're doing. Social science and humanities are down here. We don't depend on each other largely, and we really don't agree on what we should be doing. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a fact of the way the world works in science and social sciences and humanities. But as we move into the big data space and sharing, we're being pushed into this area where we depend on each other, and we have to agree more on what we should be doing with that. And that's not a comfortable space for many of us to be in as we're starting to answer, ask these new kinds of questions. So back to my hyphen to wrap up. Uh, my connection between the social and the technical. I think that memory institutions have a big role to play here. That's the Radcliffe camera of the Bodleian Libraries. These are all in Oxford. That's the Ashmolean Museum, one of the oldest museums in the world. And that's the Natural History Museum, both within a block of my office. I'm working with all these organizations to think about how to use digital strategies to work with the kinds of data I've been talking about today in order to make sure that research can happen and that these kinds of questions will be moving science forward and the social sciences and the humanities forward in interesting ways in the future. And I think these are the same challenges I'm probably preaching to the choir for everyone in this room. So that's all I've got. I'm happy during the breaks. I've taken up uh, just uh, almost my time, maybe two minutes over. I'm uh, happy during any of the breaks to answer any of your questions and so forth. I'll be around for the rest of the conference. Also, anybody down in Christchurch, I'm going to be giving a similar talk and a similar workshop down in Christchurch on Thursday and Friday. And then I'll be up at the Auckland Museum on December 12th, anybody who's based up there. And I'm happy to talk to people while I'm here in New Zealand. So thank you very much for your time and attention. Hopefully, you've gotten something out of the talk today. Thanks. Thank you. Oh.